Hello, and welcome to the second episode of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Ray. In this episode, we're going to start our look at the biggest money laundering scandal yet discovered. We're going to keep it as non-technical as we can, because it's absolutely fascinating. And it concerns Denmark's Danske Bank, and in particular, its activities in Estonia. And it's quite a story, Ray. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Good. But look, before we start, I'm very conscious that I've lived and breathed this story for the last year and a half, and it would be so easy for me to make assumptions about what our listeners already know. So, Ray, you've been far too busy working for a living, thank you, (laughs) um, to, to go into great depth on what happened. So why don't you tell me what you currently know, and then we'll start from there. Yeah, fine. Um, Well, I suspect my understanding is somewhere in between the man on the street and the man on the other microphone. So here we go. Okay, Danske Bank had a branch in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, which over a period of seven or eight years, allegedly, processed about 200 billion euros of dark money on behalf of persons unknown, most of whom appear to be based in Central and Eastern Europe. So, I mean, for a start, Ray, 200 billion euros is just an an unimaginable sum for most people, isn't it? That's true. For most people, and I include myself in this, once we get past a million, things get a bit fuzzy, and, and it's hard to appreciate the scale of big sums. But here's something that might help when we talk about millions and billions. If you were to start counting at the rate of one number per second, so one, two three, four, and so on. And if you could stay constantly awake while you did that, if you kept counting, you'd reach one million in about 11 and a half days, so just over a week and a half. To get to one billion, just one billion, you'd have to keep going for another 32 years, Graham. Wow. So, hold on, so to get to 200 billion, Ray, would take, what, Nearly six and a half thousand years of constantly counting with no sleep. So actually, I need just to think about that, Ray. So you're saying 11 and a half days, one million, mm-hmm. 32 years or more for a billion, mm-hmm. 200 billion is six and a half thousand years. Of counting, yeah, with no sleep, remember. Well, OK, so 200 billion euros is a huge <laughs> amount of money. <laughs> yeah, that, that, um, that, that's the short version, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you you have literally just scrambled my brain, but that's okay. It's it's easy to scramble. Um, what else do we know about Danska Estonia then and the money? It appears to be associated with at least two other well-known money laundering cases: the Russian and the Azerbaijani laundromats. It all came to light following a whistleblower going to a Danish newspaper who worked with the people who brought you the Panama Papers, uh, and they're called the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, or OCCRP, who've just named Danske Bank, incidentally, as their 2019 Corrupt Actor of the Year. Blimey. Actually, Ray, I I think we we went to a presentation while we were at Deutsche Bank where Paul Radu, I think, the head of the OCCRP, came along and, and spoke to us, didn't he? That's right. Brilliant. Well, look, um, that's that explanation is definitely closer to this man on the mic than the man on the street. But it's a it's a brilliant introduction to the story. Thank you. Thank you. But it's not the whole story, is it, Graham? Uh, no, there's there really is much more to it. But it is complex and it is lengthy and it needs some fairly careful explanation. Should we make a start then? Yes. And what better place to start than at the beginning? <laughs> I, think it's, um, I think it's important for our listeners to understand the importance of Danske Bank within Denmark specifically, but also within the Nordics and the Baltics generally. Um, let me butt in there. Should I explain in case anyone isn't certain exactly which countries are included when you talk about Nordics and Baltics? I think that's a good idea, yes. We use the term Nordics because uh, it more precisely includes Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Finland, as well as Iceland, Greenland and a few little islands, whereas Scandinavia, when it refers to countries, is usually taken to mean just Norway, Sweden and Denmark. The Baltics, or more precisely the Baltic states, 
refers to three countries which sit on the eastern seaboard of the Baltic Sea, and those are Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania. Well, thank you. I've, I've already learned something today. Well, great. <laughs> Thanks. So, going back to, to Danske Bank, it's been around for, what, about 150 years? It was founded about the same time as our own cooperative bank, but honestly, unlike the co-op here in the UK, Danske is the largest uh, bank in Denmark. It's got nearly 3 million customers, which... We bear in mind the population of Denmark is only a little under 6 million, really represents the equivalent of half of the entire population. Whereas, we look at the co-op here in the UK, its customer numbers of about 1.5 million account for only just about 2% of the population. Mm. Although, unlike the co-op here in the UK, Danske Bank's customers are not all in Denmark, are they? As we're about to find out. Oh no, they're not. In fact, amongst other places, it has a presence here in the UK as well, doesn't it? It does. It bought Northern Ireland's Northern Bank in uh, 2004, and it's actually been known uh, in Northern Ireland by, as Danske Bank since 2012, and it has about 430,000 customers out there. And it's one of four Northern Irish banks authorised to issue its own banknotes. Uh, yes, it is. OK. Danske Bank is about as old as Co-op Bank, but it's larger by comparison to the population it serves than, say, Barclays or Lloyds Banking Group are here in the UK. Yes, and I think it's important for our listeners to really appreciate the context when we go on to talk about the background to this story. Uh, Lloyd's Banking Group has about um, 27 million customers, or the equivalent of about 40% of the UK population. And that's a very similar number, as it happens, to the combined RBS NatWest Group, which means that Danske serves a greater number of people pro rata than either of those banking groups do. And... As we now know only too well, it expanded its operations in the mid-2000s with the acquisition of Sampo Bank in Finland, which extended its reach to include not just Finland, but Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, as well as a branch in Russia. It did. Is it worth spending a bit of time talking about that acquisition? Definitely, given that at the very least... Some of the issues we're going to talk about were inherited from when the bank was still owned by Sampo. I think it's very relevant. Right. Well, I've been reading the Danske Stock Exchange announcement from that time. Yes, you you get all the exciting tasks, Ray, don't you? I do, because you delegate them to me, Graham. (laughs) Um, So, moving on. um, Danske said in the announcement that the acquisition was in line with the group strategy of its retail banking activities in Northern Europe. Hmm. So, do we know how big Sampo was at the time of the purchase? Yes, we do. The announcement goes on to say that Sampo had 125 branches and 3,475 employees in Finland, and the three Baltic countries together were home to 33 more branches and a further 1,100 employees, of which 17 of the branches and 593 of the employees were in Estonia. Which means that Estonia was uh, the biggest of the Baltic operations, but was still, I guess, pretty small compared to the Finnish business. Mm, Yes. Danska also acquired Industry and Finance Bank of St. Petersburg, which had only recently been taken over by Sampo, and which, according to the announcement, served mainly Finnish customers doing business in Russia. It was pretty small, though, with total assets of just 1.2 million euros, but it did have all the relevant banking licences, which I guess made it quite attractive. OK, so let's just do a quick summary. And, and Ray, I think we sh- we'll do these quite frequently as we go along, because this is a lot mm-hmm. of information for people to take in. So, Good idea. Where are we at the moment? Danske acquire Sampo, which was primarily a Finnish bank. It had reasonable operations in the Baltics, mainly in Estonia, but also in Lithuania and Latvia. And it had a small banking unit in St. Petersburg. That's about it. OK, and, and Danske were pretty quickly alerted to something of a problem, weren't they? Yes, they were, and this is where it starts getting interesting. It, it does. Well, Ray, while you were reading the Danske Bank Stock Exchange announcement, I was reading the Brun and Hela r- report, and, and can I just say at this point, if we've got listeners from the Nordics listening in, I am so sorry for my pronunciation. Yeah, quite right, but um, I, I <laughs> think that does actually make for quite interesting reading, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. Um, 
we'll be coming back to it quite a few times, both in, in this podcast and in future episodes. I mean, it, it is quite hard work at times because it's written by lawyers, but it, it's worth the effort to dig into it a bit and really work out what they're trying to say. Well, that's our job, isn't it, Graham? We take a load of dense and complex information and turn it into a story that non-experts have got a chance of understanding. Exactly, Ray. We do all the hard work, so you, the listeners, just don't have to. So, back to the report. What did it have to say about this early alert to potential trouble? Well, two things. One, the report says that the Estonian regulator had issued a critical inspection report. And even more interestingly, that the Russian central bank had alerted Danske Bank via a message through the Danish FSA, pointing to possible, and I quote, tax and customs payment evasion and, again a quote, criminal activity in its pure form, including money laundering, which was estimated at, and again a quote, billions of rubles monthly. Wow. Um, OK, I'm going to take you back through some of that fairly carefully because there's, there, there's a lot um, packed in there. So first of all, you've got the Russian Central Bank. Now, the Russian Central Bank has responsibility for um, preventing or seeking to prevent um, money laundering within its borders. Um, so it's perfectly natural that it might reach out to the Danish FSA. The Danish FSA, just like its UK counterpart, the UK's um, FCA, uh, is an organisation which is set up by law and it's charged with looking after the financial system and in part protecting the integrity of the financial system against things like money laundering and, uh, and other financial crime. So here you have the Russian regulator alerting the Danish regulator that a bank that it's just bought um, might have some problems with money laundering. OK, so that's the, that's the first point of clarity. The second is when you talk about billions of rubles every month. Now, that sounds like an absolute fortune, but it is important to point out that back in 2007... The average value of one ruble was about 2p, um, a little under 2 cents. So 1 billion rubles equated to 20 million pounds. So if we're talking about billions in the plural, we can assume that that equates to something between, say, 20 million and, I don't know, 60 million pounds, um, which is still a lot of money to be laundered on a monthly basis. Right. Uh, that's all absolutely on the money or on the rubles. Um so even at the lower end, that would equate to about £250 million a year. And mm. even at today's values, that's a pretty substantial laundromat. But of course, this was happening 10 or more years ago. And yet nothing was done. And I'm not entirely sure that people have picked up on that note from the Russian Central Bank um, to the Danish regulator. You'd have thought that that would have aroused some fairly keen curiosity, wouldn't you? Well, I would have thought that, yes. And another thing, it just seems kind of unlikely to me that given the, the numbers that you've just quoted, this would be the first time the Russians had alerted someone about the problem. The, the report that Brun and Hellyer did had pretty restricted terms of reference, so it, it could only look at when Danska owned the Estonian branch. But I can't remember anyone ever asking the question, had Sampo previously been warned about the problems in Estonia. Um, yeah. And and if they if they had, uh, emphasis on the if, um, what happened when Danske did its due diligence prior to the purchase? Wouldn't they have found out about that? Well, again, you'd have thought so. And, and what if they hadn't warned Sampo prior to the purchase? Well... Then you'd need to wonder what the motivation was to issue this warning immediately after Danske had bought the bank when they never issued one before. Well, that's that's a really interesting question. And, and Ray, I'm going to have to tell you that I have actually heard, a, I, I'm going to be honest, a really wacky theory about that, um, that exact idea and why it might have happened. Uh, well, I think I know where you're going with this, but go on. 
All right, but I just want to be clear at the outset. I'm just not suggesting in any way that this is true. But it is an interesting idea, so it's just worth having a chat about. This was put to me by someone who I'm not going to name for fairly obvious reasons. But they said that the Russians contacted Danska after the purchase in order to, to test the water to see if that change of ownership was going to change the manner in which the Estonian branch was run, uh, which might affect the current activity that was going through the bank there. Yeah. OK, as if they were actually quite well disposed to that activity. Um, th- th- they would like to know if there was going to be an interruption to it. Yes, I think that's that's how it was put to me. Wow. Yes. Do we know how much went through the Estonian branch before Danske bought Sampo? No, because it's not in the report. So the first year we know about is 2007, and it was about 18 billion, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, oh, it would be so nice to know what happened previously. It really would, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. But anyway, what is clear from the report, I've just said 18 billion in 2007. In 2008, the flows went down quite dramatically and then they started building up again over the subsequent years until they hit something of a crescendo in 2013. That seems to imply there's circumstantial evidence to support your wacky theory or your friend's wacky theory. <laughs> that I happen just to be reporting. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so I... I think what I'm saying, I'm not necessarily saying the evidence supports it, but I think I'm saying it doesn't immediately disprove that theory. So um, I'm not sure if that's quite the same thing. But anyway, that's where I'm going to to leave it. Well, it's all pretty wacky. Uh, It is. It's it's wacky, but intriguing. Let's move on. I think it's important at this point to talk a bit about the global financial crisis that was about to engulf all the banks. 2007 was the start of the credit crunch. Bear in mind that Danske had agreed to buy Sampo in late 2006 and completed the deal in early 2007. So they were just starting to integrate their new buy um, at exactly the same time the credit crunch was beginning to hit. And you're spot on, Ray, and that context is really important. So over the next year or two, following 2007, many banks, including a good few here in the UK and elsewhere, needed really significant public investment to save them from going under. Now, Danske was badly hit in its home market and in Northern Ireland, so taking on a new acquisition at the same time all this was going on wasn't very helpful. OK, so Danske has potentially problematic business in Estonia and maybe elsewhere. But at the same time, that business, say what you like about about that business, but it was making mm. good profits for them um, at a time when they really needed it because they were facing big challenges elsewhere. And that's a really valid observation. Now, obviously, we can't second guess what was going on in the boardroom at Danske Bank, uh, and I wouldn't want to. But without a doubt, the Estonian branch was profitable. And without a doubt, Danske was cutting back their operations in other countries. Now, I found reports in the press which quote them as closing branches in Northern Ireland, in Sweden, in Norway and Denmark. And, and at that point, it went by market value from the second to the fourth largest bank in the Nordics. Now, all of this must have had some bearing on the thinking of the board at the time um, when they were looking at the Estonia situation, wouldn't you think? Well, I would have thought so, yes. So when Danske Bank, via the Danish FSA, was warned that many millions of dollars of potentially criminal funds were flowing through its newly acquired branch in Estonia, they were also wrestling with a significant increase in what we call impaired loans, which essentially are mortgages where the borrower might not have the funds to pay anymore. Yes, and and that's important because those loans have a value which goes down when the impairment increases. So that forces the bank to hold more liquid assets to cover the impairments. And that in turn means they have less that they can spend on things like wages and rents and other business costs. And a nice, profitable, cash-rich business in Estonia doesn't want to become a problem child, does it? No, uh, and that's another thing that's worth mentioning up front. The Brun and Heller report makes it very clear that in respect of the non-resident portfolio in Estonia, the branch took no credit risk of any significance, and for that reason, very little capital was needed there. OK, we're going to need to unpick that last sentence a little bit. Um, first of all, you mentioned the non-resident portfolio. What was that? 
Oh, no, good point. So that was the part of the business that provided banking services to people and businesses that weren't themselves based in Estonia. OK, if I've got this right, then we've got a Danish bank, which has just bought a Finnish bank, which has a branch in Estonia providing banking for non-Estonians, a significant percentage of which were from Russia. Yes, it's simple. It's just the equivalent of, say, the Co-op Bank here in the UK buying a French bank which had a branch in Portugal providing banking services to Greeks. I'm going to be honest with you here, Graham. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I'm going to be honest with you here, Ray. Banking and sense are not always the most comfortable of bedfellows. You also said that the branch took no credit risk of any significance and for that reason needed little capital. That meant they didn't lend anyone any money and therefore they didn't need the bank to provide them with money to lend and therefore potentially lose in impaired debts. And when we use the the, the word capital, that's what banks use to describe the cushion they hold so that when lots of people can't afford to repay the debts, that the bank stays afloat. That's absolutely right. Um, it also means that the, the bulk of their day-to-day business there was what is referred to as flow, um, which essentially means just the normal everyday business of receiving money into an account and then sending it on somewhere else as necessary. Um, I should mention at this point there was also a bond trading desk in Danska, Estonia, but I think we'll leave that to a future episode when we get to talk about mirror trades. Oh, buying and selling mirrors, are we? <laughs> no, it's a bit more complicated than that, which is really the reason it needs its own special episode. OK, do we know how big the non-resident portfolio was? Yes, we do. The report, again, um, says that in the period between when the bank acquired Sampo in 2007 and 2015, when the portfolio was fully closed down, around 10,000 customers in total had been part of the portfolio, of which about 4,000 or so were active at any one time. We also know that in addition, there were about 5,000 other customers who met the definition of non-resident, but who sat outside of the specialist group who managed the defined non-resident portfolio. OK, so to simplify that, altogether, between 2007 and 2015, there were 15,000 non-residents banking with the Estonian branch of the former Finnish bank now owned by Danes. You know, it sounds a bit weird when you put it like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is. Although, to be fair, um, this non-resident portfolio only accounted for between 2% and 4% of the total number of customers using the branch. Possibly, but it also accounted for a much bigger part of the profit. Anyway, let's just do another quick recap. Danska have acquired a bank with a profitable Estonian branch, which has 15,000 non-residents who don't appear ever to want to borrow any money. They provide very significant revenue at a time when there is a liquidity crisis on the horizon. Danske are told shortly after the acquisition via the Danish regulator that the bank might be laundering millions of pounds in dark money. That sounds about right. Um, And according to what's in the report, even in 2007, the total flow through the branch from the non-resident portfolio was around 18 billion euros. Um, It peaked in 2013 at around 32 billion euros before dropping back as customers were exited finally. Yes, that's right. So so in 2007, this 18 billion euros went through about 4,000 accounts. Now, that's one and a half billion euros a month on average. And by 2013, they had risen to more than 2.6 billion euros a month and this is at a time when Estonia's annual total GDP went from 34 billion euros in 2007 to nearly 38 billion euros in 2015 and that means 2013 the the flow represented the equivalent of about 90 percent of Estonia's entire GDP. Yeah and all of that through one bank. Yeah that's just utterly extraordinary. It absolutely is. And and just to be clear, ING didn't actually do that. No, 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 they didn't. No, no. Um, Graham, now you've been given access to some of the bank statements relating to the non-resident portfolio, haven't you? Yes, Ray. Yes, I have. Yes. 
And uh, I know in our next episode we're going to talk a lot more about the nature of those accounts and, and some of the enormous sums of money involved. But as a prelude to that, do you want to take a, a minute to explain how all of that came about? Well, yeah, why don't I? Now, Ray, I, I know you love reading, um, mm-hmm. and you you will have read a Stephen King book called Eleven Twenty Two Sixty Three. I'm sure of that. Oh yes. Um, so you'll know in that in that book, it's a great book. The same line appears repeatedly throughout, and, and that line is "Life turns on a dime." And and oddly, that's exactly what happened to me around. 18 months ago, I wrote an article called Who is Ali Moulay and Why Does It Matter? I remember it well, Graham, and I think we probably need to do an episode about the mysterious Mr Moulay and, and if and why he matters. I, I think that's a really good idea. Sorry, though, I interrupted you. Carry on. Oh, no worries. When, when I wrote that article, I happened to mention as a result of some research I'd done, a UK limited liability partnership called Lantana Trade LLP. Well, I I genuinely didn't know at the time the relevance of that particular company. All I knew was it had been involved in a very obscure Russian court case with another entity that I was interested in called Financial Bridge. And we will certainly be talking about that company again. And therefore, I included it in my article. Now, in reality... Lantana Trade LLP was allegedly directly related to um, President uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia through his cousin Igor. And it was definitely at the heart of what precipitated the whistleblower to go to the press. Wow. Um, Indeed. Uh, So I was I was honestly somewhat bemused in my ignorance when after I put that article up on the Internet, way more people than I ever expected read it. And I also started to receive connection requests on LinkedIn from journalists. And now that's something that never happened to me before. So what happened next? Well, I was contacted by uh, a really nice guy called Michael Lund from, from a Danish newspaper called Berlingske, which had received the leak material from the whistleblower. And he wanted to know if I'd be prepared to help them by reviewing some of the Danske Bank statements to make sure their interpretation of money laundering on them was correct. And was it? Oh, yes. And that's the subject for our next episode, then? It is. Um, But just to be clear, I did give an undertaking of confidentiality as to the specific names contained within those bank statements while ongoing investigations take place throughout the world and which may well result in criminal proceedings. And and oddly, in the week we're recording this, Ray, um, some developments have happened in that respect. Oh yes, that's right. In um, in France, the authorities had announced a criminal investigation uh, into the Danska affair, um, and and had named Danska as a witness in that investigation. But now uh, they may well be um, citing Danska as a criminal suspect. Uh, that's one to watch, and I have, may well be that we'll come back to that in a future podcast in rather more detail. Um, anyway. I have been cleared to talk about the way in which these accounts were conducted. So we're talking about the volumes and the values of transactions going through them and and other elements which are really instructive for our audience, but which don't give away potentially incriminating evidence. Helpfully, there are now a handful of names out in the public domain, um, and we can talk about those in a bit more detail. It sounds rather exciting. Well, do you know, Ray, I think it will be. So next time, then, uh, we'll look at some actual accounts and see in quite a bit of detail, how the whole thing actually worked. That is right, and I think it's going to be a bit of an eye-opener. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to the second episode of The Dark Money Files, and we hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or your normal podcast provider. Thanks. Thanks.